Yes, we're ready to start. Great. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. We are delighted to be with you this morning. Of course, we're looking forward to the first WFTGA 2020 journey. And we hope we have many, many more of these for communicating purposes. My name is Gene Rays. I am coming to you from the beautiful city of New Orleans, Louisiana in the USA. Delighted to be with you this morning. We have some presenters that we're gonna be introducing later on that I know you're gonna be excited about. But right now we would like to introduce our president and our executive board if we have any members. Madam President, anything you got to say? Thank you, Jean. Yes, we're looking forward to today's session, day one of our journeys. And um, I've seen some previews of some of the presentations and I'm quite excited to, to hear and share what's, what's being done across the globe. So from my side, um, thank you for hosting today, Jean. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. And we obviously welcome all our participants as well. I see we are currently on YouTube as well, live streaming. So thank you. And yes, let's get these sessions going. Thank you, Jean. The floor is yours. Thank you. And yes, of course, a big, big welcome to our presenters. We have eight of them today. I'll be going through the order in a few minutes. But of course, we also want to thank our all important viewers, the members. WGA, this is an opportunity to improve on our communications. This is just one example that we will continue to strive for. All right. Let's run through the program briefly to let you know the order. And what I will do is I will not introduce you. I will let you introduce yourself. I will say speaker number one and give the country, though you know it's you. Then we want you to give us your name, the country and city that you represent, the name of your association. And hopefully, if you have it, the number of members that your association currently has. So, we have a few housekeeping rules we need to go over. Now, don't be aware that the presentations, each present presenter, they have a maximum time of 12 minutes. 12 minutes because we have eight presenters. So, we want to be fair to everyone. As you're approaching, the end of your 12 minutes presenters, I will say very quietly, one minute. That means for you, it's time for you to start wrapping up your comments. And then I will let you know when your session has ended. So we keep everything in order. Questions? Verbally, we'll be, we'll be between the presenters. They may be able to be asked the questions between themselves. Only them, though. Viewers may post questions, as we know, in chat box. And we'll have time after the first four presenters. We'll hope to address some of those. But the main thing is that you realize the true session. What is the true reason that we're doing this? Because this is an opportunity for you, the WFTGA Association members, to share your challenges that you have faced this year from your association and from your members' point of view. It is also an opportunity to share your success stories. We realize that many of you have embarked on wonderful internal journeys and projects, and we look forward to you sharing this with our members. This program, of course, presents us with the environment to inspire, to learn, and acknowledge and support one another, which we know is very, very important. This session for our members, about our members, and by any other means, will only be focused on our members and will not address anything or matters related to WFTGA itself. This is for the members. And then we're going to start by moving into the program. Like I said, I will announce presenter number one, and they will proceed to introduce themselves. After the first four sessions, as I stated, we'll have some time for some questions and answers. All right. Any comments from the presenters? Any questions? All right. There being none, let's go ahead and get started. And our first presenter is from 
country of France. <laughs> delighted to have her. Looking forward to it. And would you please introduce yourself? Tell us where you're coming from, the name of your association, approximate numbers. Please proceed. So hello everybody. Yes, and come from that city that makes you dream, Paris. My name is Helga. I'm a tour guide in Paris uh, since already six years. And I'm very, very excited, but also nervous to do this presentation I, as I am the first one. Jean, do you want everybody to present uh, themselves one by one, or sh uh, you tell me when I should start my presentation, please. No, you go ahead and start, and then I will, when you're through, I will introduce the next presenter. Okay. I, I go? Okay. I yeah. share my screen. Okay. So, there we go. Okay, so I have now 12 minutes, is that right? So, I would like to share this uh, slide with you just uh, to introduce you to the Federation of France. Uh, in whole France, we are about 4,000 guides. And just the very first question maybe it's, what is that what I've written, guide conférencier? In France, we have a special title, a special study to be a tourist guide. And after this university degree, we get a, this kind of card. And this card is the only one that allows a guide uh, to present um, everything in a museum, in an official museum. You cannot be presenting in the Louvre, the Mona Lisa, if you didn't make your uh, university study and you got this official card. So at the Federation, we are 1,400 members. And since uh, March, since pandemia, we saw an increase very high of, of 20% people looking help for the Federation because we have 40 years of experience. The Federation exists already 40 years. And our goal is not only representing our profession, but inform others, promote and protect. There are a lot of regulations in France. France is a country of regulations. And so uh, we are here also, the Federation is here to protect. So my next slide, up, it's, I tried to skip my, my file and it doesn't work, or it's very slow. Uh, my next slide is about the tour guide day, and uh, the photo shows you in Alsace, this is a, a region in between, let's say, France and Germany, a very special uh, region, and uh, what I would like to share is their absolutely super uh, idea of making on that day speed tours. What is a speed tour? So a guide went just to normal people saying, do you have 10 minutes? I will guide you only 10 minutes and I will show you the cathedral facade in 10 minutes. And that was a fantastic opportunity to let people feel what is a tour guided uh, tour and what is a professional tour guide and how enthusiastic it is. It was in order to cut uh, the attention of the local people. And uh, what we saw is uh, during this tour guide day, we had the first experience to organize a similar tour by 10, 20 different guides. So this is my second point, my tour, your tour, it is our tour. And we begin to share information about each tour. And after that, we were a little bit disappointed because we saw that we had not so much impact. 
So uh, this is something we want to change in next year. We would like to, that communication is more fluent, that people know what a tour guide is and what we are proposing. The next slide is something we are very, very proud. This is our best, best success. The official uh, tourism office in Paris gave to our federation a subvention, a subvention of 100,000 euros. It's a lot of money in this moment. And they organized for us a schedule and in total, in July, August 2020, when it was so difficult for our tour guides because we have no international tourists here in Paris, we organized 700 tours. So with about 15 participant, uh, participants in average, and that makes 12,000 visitors. It is a lot and this was a great success and let me show you by an example. Uh, the next slide shows me a colleague of me who is Natasha. And Natasha will represent one of us. And Natasha normally, she guides German and English speaking tourists in a museum like Louvre or Orsay or the uh, castle of uh, Versailles. And here she said, it is the first time I have to guide in French to local people who know all our history, but then it was the opportunity for local visitors that they discover their own city. They do not know everything of Paris. So, and she, she as well as other guides were forced for looking for new topics. She said to me, I never guided street art it's too modern for me. I always went to the classical periods of uh, painting of, uh, of our painters. So this was just a new experience. Pandemia forced us to get out of our uh, path, of our common path. And uh, that also was great to communicate in between tour guides and learning from others, from younger, for example, younger tour guides, how to make a tour more modern, I would say, with quiz and with um, participation and uh, like, uh, like a little escape game in an absolutely normal tour gu uh, guide. And that gave us a lot, a lot of success and people wrote back to the tourism office that they were absolutely enjoying it and that they should promote these free tours by official tourist guides. So for the local person, for the tourists, it was free, but we were paid by this subvention of uh, 100,000 euros. My next slide is showing something probably everybody of us uh, had to learn, is how to go virtual. Normally, we tourist guides are always outdoors, in museum, in, uh, uh, in Palais de Versailles, whatever, but no so long. And all these new technologies are a big, big challenge that we have to learn. So. We learn, 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 and we had the opportunity during this uh, six weeks, we were at home and we could not go more than one kilometer away of our house, that learning from people that are very, very good with this new, uh, new programs like Zoom, for example, they just, taught us how to use it and how to make even virtual tours for people coming from all over the world and they, uh, how to share. So yes, the other question of our panel was what is going on with the government? Did the government help us as a tour guide? 
Yes, they have. However, however, the problem is the different status we have here in France. Some of the guys are salaried, are employed directly by an agency. A lot of us are independent. And some of them, they have a special status. So making it clear for everybody, those who are, were employed by an agency, they get help. And people who were absolutely 100% independent, they got help too. The other ones, no. Therefore, you have maybe seen in the news that tour guides are in Paris and all over France, they are doing demonstration, as you see here in the photos, they are asking for help because since March, they do not have any work and they do not have any help. 50% of us do not get financial help. And the Federation made a survey and this survey made that 45% of the French tour guides, they are looking for another job. They are looking to quit tour guiding. My last slide for you is, what is our future? What is our challenge? And for me, the most important is to continue our effort to defend our profession. A lot of people, are thinking that we are, uh, either it is a profession for foreign students they, that won't have a little bit more money, and we get a lot of competition of no, not official, not professional tour guides, and we have to try to defend our, um, our profession this way. And also, we, want to build new partnership as, as we did with the uh, official to, uh, tourism office but maybe with other cities or with other regions with transport companies in order that a tourist that buys for example a ticket with the french uh, train he gets automatically the a proposal to participate to a tour guided um, tour in Paris. One minute. And so in this last minute, I just want to say, we are used always to keep learning, learning, learning. And after this pandemic, I guess the most important is to share as we do are doing today, our experience and to learn of the success of other uh, tourist guides associations. What, what was good for you or what was good for us in order that we can improve? Thank you, thank you, Olga. That's uh, excellent. That's exactly what we're looking for, to be able to share, to share these stories and, and comments between ourselves because that's also important. Now, get back with me one section because as usual, I forgot to do a couple of things, which is kind of, kind of famous for because I'm getting old. No, I want to be sure that we recognize our technical support because without them we would not be having this program. So a big big welcome to Sebastian Frankenberger and to Constantine Rose. They are our technical support for today and we certainly appreciate their efforts and support. I want to run through the program again which I should do just to make sure everybody's confirmed. We started off, of course, with Olga. Next will be the city of New York. And then number three will be Israel, which will be taped, I believe. And number four will be Turkey. That's the first four speakers, the first session. After that first session, we'll ask some question and answers, and then we'll proceed on. Number five will be from the Philippines. Number six from Italy. And number seven from our host in 2022 from Serbia. And our last but not least from Scotland. All right, let's start off now with our second presenter from. Tell us your name, please. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emma Guest Gonzalez, and I am the president of the Guides Association of New York City, also known as GANIC. Um, and I am in living in New Jersey, but of course, all our guides are based in the city of New York. So I'll be sharing my screen, and I'll be taking you through our journey of New York City during uh, COVID-19. So I'm, again, really happy and honored to be here and to be representing GANIC. We currently have, we currently have around 300, nearly 400 members in GANIC. We have 380 active members, and we have been very fortunate that over the past year, in spite of the pandemic, we have actually added around a dozen new members. And needless to say, we were ready for a banner year in New York City, but of course, this was a year like no other. We, uh, we were going to, we start out with our wonderful holiday party um, right in the heart of Times Square. Um, and to look back on photographs when everyone's all crowded together is um, quite nostalgic. And uh, I do want to mention one of our great members who passed away in January, and that was Lee Gelber, our Dean of New York City Guides. Now, in February, Gannick attended the NFTGA, the National Federation of Tourist Guides Association, their biennial conference in the city of Charleston in South Carolina, where our um, past president, Michael Dillinger, was elected as vice president. But in February, as we all know, of course, things started getting um, more and more precarious around the world. And February 22nd was International Tour Guide Day. Now we celebrated that day in Chinatown at the Museum of the Chinese in America. And we went there specifically to help support the Chinese and the Chinese American community, which was already feeling the effects of COVID-19 in Wuhan. And so we had a wonderful time all together. And then our final events were in March. On March 2nd, we had our Apple Awards. This is an annual celebration where the best of New York City is celebrated by those who know New York City the best. And uh, we also give out awards for um, great guides and which we have now nominated in honor of Lee Gelber and is the Lee Gelber Guiding Spirit Award. Uh, the image on the right is from our very last FAM tour. This was at the Croton Aqueduct, which is in upstate New York. And, and this was the last time we really all gathered in a large number on March 11th, because March 12th was what um, we have dubbed in New York City uh, Red Thursday. Now, um, I also volunteer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So for me personally, everything was really started going down at noon when the museum announced that it would be closing that afternoon uh, after all the guests left um, um, for further notice. And then uh, Broadway theaters shortly afterwards, the announcements just kept coming in that places were closing. And by the end of the week, most of the major attractions in New York City had shut their doors. Hundreds of tours had been canceled and New York, City, um, New York State and New York City went on pause. That's what our governor called it, New York State pause. Gannick did not. Uh, in fact, we really hit the accelerator and that is due to our wonderful board and our wonderful, wonderful members. Now, this is a photo from our happy, uh, happier occasion. This was at our Apple Awards. And I just want to mention um, our board, which is just fantastic. And I'll go from left to right, the gentleman in the white tuxedo, Kevin Lawrence, one of our members at large. Um, the lady with the red hair is Deborah Blau. She's one of our uh, board members at large as well. Behind her stands John Semlak, our corresponding secretary. And next to John is Bob Gelber, who is our, um, one of our vice presidents. I'm in red. I usually wear that all day long. Today, I decided to change it up a bit. <laughs> and next to me is Christina Lombardi, and also another one of our board members at large. Jeremy Wilcox stands next to Christina. He does our PR as well as being our treasurer, so he's amazingly talented. Next to Jeremy, we have Patrick Casey, who is our recording secretary, as many other hats. Um, all of our board members do many things, especially Mike Morgenthal, our second vice president, who spearheaded a lot of great initiatives. And so this board has been working um, since the very beginning to empower and to inform 
our GANIC members. And GANIC has been a leader um, in the tourism industry on behalf of guides. And this started with Mike Morgenthal, who created a spreadsheet to collect the data on tour cancellations, including cancellations from non-GANIC members. Now, while we have, while we have 350 active members, um, we also have a lot of people, of course, in New York City who are not members of GANIC. They're slowly joining. And they were um, welcome to add their tours to our tour cancellation database. And we shared this data with travel organizations and with the media and many other associations to show the dire straits of tour guides in New York City and really reflecting the state of guiding um, throughout the United States, even the world. Um, the hard numbers um, since March 2020, uh, 5,717 tours have been canceled, over 9,000 days of lost work, and $2.8 million worth of lost revenue. Now, one thing that's different is GANIC and tour guides do not receive any government assistance. So this was guides in really dire straits. So what did we do? Well, we pivoted and went right to doing everything we could online and to supporting our guides as much as we could. The um, board was meeting weekly. We are in constant, constant communication. We started holding our board meeting, our board meetings as well as our monthly meetings online. There are recordings of those. Those are available on our YouTube, YouTube channel. And we brought in experts from um, all around, from um, tour guiding to uh, health and safety, to wellness, unemployment insurance, many, many other different speakers to address our members. Our members also turned to use doing um, virtual tours and to providing other ways to inform people about New York City, whether it was a Facebook Live, a blog, a vlog, um, even collaboration with other guides associations such as the Guild in DC. Um, one way GANIC is keeping our members informed is with our newsletter. Now, our newsletter for guides is edited by our board member at large, Christine Lombardi, and it can be found on the website with all our digital um, resources. You can also see there a library of the virtual events, and Jeremy Wilcox helps update that, and along with Bob Gelber, who works very closely with Jeremy and the uh, Education Committee for GANIC. And the virtual is a lot of fun. We used to issue it weekly. Now it's biweekly, and if you don't receive it, you're welcome to subscribe to it. GANIC is also a member of our local destination management organization. Um, our DMO is NYC and Company. Um, we are part of their coalition for New York City hospitality and tourism recovery um, as one of the allied organizations. Um, we're all working very hard to revive tourism in New York City. But again, we don't receive assistance. Um, we were fortunate that uh, tour guides and other freelancers were um, con were included in the pandemic unemployment assistance. But again, things are very, very difficult for many guides. And so GANIC is working on providing as much support and information as we can. Here are just some views of New York City during the lockdown. And of course, I would be remiss to mention, um, we lost three guides directly to COVID. Um, Judy Richheimer on the left, Laurel Douglas um, with the brown boots on the upper right, and William Helmreich. They were organic members. They were wonderful people in our community and may their memories be a blessing. Now in June, uh, at the start at the, um, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests and rallies at the start of the summer, GANIC issued an official statement that can also be found on our website. And in fact, our July meeting was a roundtable discussion on diversity and racism and tour guiding. And we in fact have a subcommittee now on diversity headed by board member Kevin Lawrence. And we've been working to survey our, our members to get a better handle on our demographics. Now, GANIC has been active in the media as well. We were interviewed on our local news stations, New York One and ABC7. And we're also very active on social media from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram. So we do urge everyone please to follow our feeds and to keep up to date with what GANIC is doing. Now, one of the things we're most proud of is our health and safety task force that put together industry-wide standards for guides, guests, and tour operators. These again are available on our website. Everyone is welcome to share these. Our task force was led by Patrick Casey and John Semlack and Deborah Blau did our graphic design. We also had a GANIC member, um, her name is Sarah Lyons, brand new member. She just jumped in feet first and worked on this for hours and hours with us. And so um, these are really useful, important guidelines. We make sure all guides are following these guidelines 
as touring is slowly opening up again in New York City. And um, really, this shows the, the can-do spirit of Gannick, and nothing embodies that more than tour your own city. This is our initiative that was launched by Vice President Mike Morgenthau and other members of the Gannick board and of Gannick itself, especially Megan Murad, who volunteered countless hours of video editing and photography. Um, tour Your Own City is a separate website, and this is where guides can list their tours. And they can be searched by language, they can be searched by borough, they can be searched by tour type. It is uh, really a gathering platform for these tours, and then people can book them directly with a guide. Gannick does not charge our members for this service, and we do not take anything from the bookings themselves. This is to get money and to get business directly to our guides. And Tour Your Own City um, has really been going very well well. We have over 100 tours listed and more being added every day. Now, once the city opened, we were out and about. Our masks on, social distancing, um, our great landmarks and attractions are starting to open up. And we do take it all very, very seriously. I mean, you can even see the sign here. Um, our guys do not carry these signs around, but we are very careful when we are touring and we're, um, we want to welcome people back to our city. And um, it's really open and re um, welcoming and we want to see guests here and we want to support our guides as much as possible. Now, one great, one great thing about Gannick is it's very easy to get in touch with us. Um, I have here a list of our, um, of our website, as well as our different social media and Tour Your Own City. Our Gannick YouTube channel, so please be sure to subscribe to that. That is where you can watch all our past meetings. I especially recommend our July meeting. That was our diversity roundtable. And you're welcome to get in touch with me. I'm always happy to hear from anyone from around the world. There, my email is there, as is Ward's email. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them when we get to that part of the forum. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Presenters, be aware that so far, the 12 minutes is being used up, which we want, which we really appreciate. We were trying to figure in case they didn't go to 12 minutes, y'all doing an outstanding job. So thank you so much. But realize after the first four speakers, we will allow some time for the presenters to ask questions among themselves. I know they're gonna have a few. All right, let's get started with our next presenter. And if I remember correctly, this is a, a tape portion because the gentleman could not be with us because of course today being a national holiday, Jewish holiday for them. So we're gonna have a tape. Sebastian, Constantine, if you would. Hello, my name is Yoni Shapira, and I'm a ninth generation Jerusalemite, Israeli born, and I am the chairman of Israel's Tour Guide Association for Incoming Tourism called Morishet Derech, which means Heritage Trail. We have 1,500 members in our union, and we are part of the overall uh, tour guide activity in Israel, and I would like to share with you a presentation about what we did from the beginning of the pandemic when tourism stopped in March. Till so please bear with me as I will share the presentation, and hopefully it will work well. Uh, we are in the Tour Guide Association uh, working hard, and I'd like to mention that I'm not with you live today as you view this because it's Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur in the Israeli calendar is the most, Jewish calendar is the most important holiday uh, which we fast, which we contemplate about things we did. We say sorry for things we did not mean to do, and uh, we reflect inwards. And this is a day that I cannot be on the computer, I will not be on the computer, and therefore, thank you to the administration of the conference for allowing me to share this with you as a recorded message. So I'll go ahead and we'll go through the presentation. And basically, who are we, Israeli tour guides? We are all together about 8,300 uh, tour guides, among them about 3,000 are in inbound tourism. It's a small country, only nine and a half million citizens. 
and over four and a half million tourists arrived here in 2019, which was an all time high. Talking about the tour guide union and our needs made me realize something interesting that I'd like to share with you, that we are a cross section of the society that no other sector in the country can claim. We are Jews, Muslims, Christians of all denominations. We are Bedouin, we are Druze, we have Cherkess, other religious groups that are here. We represent the entire political spectrum from extreme left to extreme right. But we don't share our per point of view, we share the country. And therefore we are not political, we are apolitical as a union and as a tour guide is required to be. We range in age from 20 to 80. There are those who still continue working at the age of 80 and new starters. But this is the only sector in Israeli society where women and men have equal working conditions, equal pay, regardless of the time of seniority. I'm over 40 year tour guide, a new tour guide, woman, men, regardless. They just started a couple of years ago, will get the same income from me. We are in a problem. March, tourism stopped. And by May, we realized that the government is not responding well to any demands of the tourism. So we in Mauritius Dech organized a major demonstration in front of the parliament, which you can see the bottom picture. And in that demonstration, we brought together other sectors in the tourism industry that were totally transparent to the government. The travel agents, the airlines, and the hotels got support, got financial benefits. All others, attractions, bus drivers, tour guides, small businesses, 25,000 of them that create and generate the tourism economy got nothing. So we called for it, and you could see the purple color is dominant. That's the purple color of our tag and of the union. And this started a whole new activity, activity of writing and calling the government to participate. But that didn't help. And when we did not get responses by 24th of June, a member of our union, Peter, decided he's going on a hunger strike. He pitched up his little tent just in front of the parliament, not far from the treasury, and slowly and surely other people managed, joined him, and there were three hunger strikers who drank only water, no food, for nearly two months. We had other people participate, and other people come and spend the day and night at the tent, as you see the tent grew, and that attracted people. We were right next to the parliament so we could stop advisors, consultants, spokespeople, and members of Knesset and invite them in and talk to them. In the middle picture, you could see the general manager of Israel Ministry of Tourism, which did not really respond too well to our demands and basically the answer to everything is we have no budget. But it did give us an exposure. And over the period of a couple of months, nearly three months, we managed to meet with over 70 members of Knesset, members of parliament out of total 120. And that gave us a buzz also in the media. And the media heard about it, came to photograph, interview us. We were called into the TV stations and we were asked to participate in Zoom meetings with committees in the Knesset to talk about opening the skies, to talk about the tourism, talk about the tour guides, talk about the economic burden and so on, and even invited into uh, meetings, committee meetings inside the Knesset itself. And in the bottom picture, that little guy in the middle is the Minister of Tourism. But unfortunately, again, he did not deliver much. So who are we? What are our problems? Well, we are all freelancers, most of us. And as freelancers, we are not entitled by law to get anything. Those who work on coaches and tour buses, they could ask for money according to the salary slips that they got from travel agents, but most of us worked on invoices. And those of us, 600 of us that have vans, like myself, by law could not get a thing. We manage over a period of four months to change the law. We are entitled now to get money. However, only in six months time can we request money according to the new law for not getting anything by owning a van. That means we will be unemployed for over a year before we can ask for any unemployment. This is crazy. So we are basically saying to the government, 
we are not in retention of tour guides because tour guides are all freelancers and all individuals. We are in a mode of survival. And we want the government to establish a fund to retain, preserve, and save the entire tourism industry, and we can help. We can help jumpstart tourism economy, and how do we suggest doing it? Every country should look at their numbers, but basically our concept says, if the government will subsidize a bus and a guide for a two-day trip, the guides will work, the buses will work, the groups will go to restaurants and food and restaurant deliveries will work, travel agents and operators setting up the program will work, hotels, hostels, campsites, and so on work. And according to plan, each uh, group will have to visit at least two sites, parks, national sites per day, stay one overnight at least on bed and breakfast so they can eat meals outside, visit markets, galleries, wineries, cultural heritage, souvenirs, and so on, generate the economy. Our calculations show that, show that on every dollar put in to the subsidy, three to five dollars will be generated into the economy. That is a win-win situation. Everybody benefits. But if we don't have any tourism, who will go on a trip? Well, here we approach the domestic tourism. Large industries, a workplace that will go and take their employees on work for two-day vacation to relax, to change climate, to get out. Pensionaire clubs, instead of being closed in homes and not being able to go out, come out. Social clubs, workers' unions, take your family, take a large group of friends and go out. And if a busload can hold 50, we will not take more than 30 according to regulations. If a minibus can take 16, we will travel with 10. We will travel within the capsule. That will generate economy and people will stop being depressed, locked into the environment. They will go out and enjoy the countryside. We have offered it to the education system where we as tour guides can teach English, Arabic, and Hebrew, which are learned in the Israeli schools on site. History and geography, sustainability and environment, arts and museums. Instead of high school kids studying four days a week in Zoom online, because there are not enough classrooms, let us take them on a tour. Let, them give us, let us give them an external experience, an experience that they'll learn much more than sitting in front of a screen. Heritage projects around the village, around the neighborhood, around the town, where the groups could start having projects to learn and about where they come from and who they are. And now door activities will generate a better environment for study. Let us do that. It was approached to the government four months, four and a half months ago, and now it's starting to happen. We'll talk about it in a minute. So what are we asking for? We're asking for, let us be part of the system. Let us help generate the income. Let us be in the consulting area and learn about what to do. And I'd like to share with you the last two minutes, two and a half minutes that I have with another short presentation of a film that was taken of an interview in front Just of the Knesset. Just outside the Israeli parliament for months now, this tent has stood alone. Occupied by a sector devastated by coronavirus, tour guides. Let the business start. Let's start generating tourism economy. Without that, you're dead. The government has announced August 16th as the day for reopening Israeli skies to tourism, but it may well be delayed. The tender for the company that will do the corona checks at the airport is only due in the first of September. So saying that they'll open on the 16th of August is a wash. It's not, it's not a reality. Tour guides made their way to the terminal at Ben Gurion International Airport in protest to receive the tourists who are simply not there. A tough reality to face. For the day when tourists do eventually arrive, a capsule tourism framework has been proposed to government in which guides will play a key role in preventing the spread of coronavirus. We will guide not open like this, but with a whisper, with a microphone under the mask where we could talk and he could roam around, take pictures, not have to be close to us to hear, and we could keep it as a capsule throughout the tour. And we are with them 24-7 from the day they arrive, from the hour they arrive, till we depart them at the airport 
and say bon voyage. But even if all this happens at some point down the road, it could take years for the tourism industry to recover, during which guides may need to work elsewhere. Thus, the creative tour guide teacher scheme was born. They are experts in storytelling, in teaching, in experiences, in creating experiences for the crowd. Why not take us into the education system that right now does not have enough classrooms to hold capsules? On Monday, Education Minister Yoav Gallant laid out the government's plan to open schools in a capsule system on September 1st. The ministry has acknowledged they need more teachers to do that. Lawmaker Mickey Levy of the Boom White Party has shown support for introducing tour guides into the school system, which can solve two problems at once. The tour guides are very important for the tourism sector. We know it will take time, so we thought outside the box, and integrating tour guides into the education system is important and welcome. It's another way of solving problems in a creative manner. These tour guides, at least, support the move. And it's not about the money. We could just sit on welfare, depend on welfare, and not go out to work. But it's not enough for us because really the tour guide, a tour guide is not only uh, doing it for the money, he's also fulfilling himself. And this is a calling. Hopefully that calling will be answered in the near future. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'm not with you live, but I'll be in tomorrow's session the day after. And I'd like to thank the administration, president, and the organizers of this conference for allowing me to send you in advance. So have a great conference day, and I'll meet you tomorrow in Zoom. Bye. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Uh, so far, doing a fantastic job, and I'm looking forward to the gentleman from Turkey. But I got to tell you very quickly that uh, I started to say at the one minute, then I realized I'd be talking to a tape. So didn't work. Kind of rough when you get old. <laughs> All right, let's hear from our next presenter from the country of Turkey, if you would, please. Hello, everyone. Warm greetings from Istanbul. My name is Mert. I've been guiding over 20 years. I'm an actual active tour guide. This is how I earn my money. And I am representing today a quite small, but very influential association based in Istanbul, History, Culture, and Tourism Guides Association. Who we are, actually, it, we're a bunch of tour guides, a seasoned uh, senior tour guides. And we always call each other in Turkish, take it easy, so I'm gonna use that nickname for us. We really focus on and we embrace three important values for guiding, creative leadership, innovative teamwork, and learning spread. This is something very important for us. We're a nonprofit and definitely a volunteer organization. Total number of members are over 70, uh, but they're not all based in Istanbul. They're coming from different parts of Turkey. Actually, number of the tour guides in Turkey is over 14,000. And tomorrow, you will have a presentation from Tour Guides Union uh, present. He will be broadcasting probably the first lecture tomorrow. And we are really focused on enhance the value and the image of tour guiding by increasing the quality of guides with trainings, lectures, and educational tours. So COVID-19, how it launched in Turkey. The first case came in March 11, and first casualty was March 18. Today, currently, when I checked the last time, the number of cases reached over 300,000, number of people tested nearly 20% uh, of the overall population. And unfortunately, we had 8,000 people died from the COVID. Our government took a lot of measurements and some of them work really well, actually. For example, the curfew over age 65 and young, younger than 20s announced at the beginning of the, at the end of the March. And we have intercity travels were restricted till the July all international flights were brought, were terminated. And after a, for a long, after a while, starting from the June, we have a normalization for starting in Turkey. Tourism is something very important. It's a hot cash, especially for countries like a Turkey. And we are the six most visited countries in the world. We got roughly last year, 
50, over 50 million people. And this year we were expecting over 60 million people. And unfortunately, this COVID was a sledgehammer for us. We lost almost 85% of the market. And although we are still tour operators from Russia, UK, Germany, and Ukraine, and few FITs from the United States come and visit Turkey, the result was a big shock for us. But thanks Lord, the Minister of Health, they really did a great job. As soon as the COVID started, we got a lot of different regulations came. For example, putting masks is compulsory all around the country, in the outside, in the public buildings, in the museum, in the schools, wherever you go, you are required to put your masks on. Same thing, wherever you go, they take your temperatures and signs are all around the country. And especially the hand sanitizers are available in front of the every public building, markets, supermarkets, anywhere you access. And of course the public transportation, they really scan the people quite well over there. So in that case, we are doing quite good. But again and again, for a tour guide's perspective, perspective, it was a shock for us because we were just talking with each other at the beginning of the March, probably when the temperature is gonna be high, everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna start our tours in June and then in September, but we realized the fact that it was not gonna be easy. That was a shock for us. And then we started to talk with each other as a seasoned senior guys. What are we are gonna do? How should we use it? And as you know, in Japanese language, crisis means opportunity. And we return back our core values, really the innovative teamwork and continuous learning, what we could do together. And so we started to generate some projects and probably the most influential one is, we started, started from the mid April till the mid June, every night, except Sundays, 9.30 in academia lectures. We're all specialized about different subjects and each of our members took responsibility and we delivered seminars in Instagram. Amazing. I personally did Judaism 101 and I couldn't believe in some of the, some prime time, we reached over 600 people watching us live in Instagram. It was a quite important number. And the subjects were so important we get so many different people, tour guides, tour guide students, and our tour members and our close inner circles, because the subjects we discussed over there were not only just for focusing on Turkey, it's about a lot of different things, different countries, different cultures. And that was, that's why it was quite progressive. And we enjoyed a lot. And the second phase we decided to do, the stumble chats with art historians, listening to, importance of Istanbul, such an important city in the world. From the perspective of the art historians was so important, especially tour guides showed a lot of participation, those important chats, which we did also from the YouTube and Instagram as well. But for me, you know that we tour guides are great learners, dedicated learners, dedicated teachers, and avid travelers. And one of the important things which we did we, reading is our automatic reflection, reflex, as you know. We read and we learn and we share. And then we decided that, why don't we share the books we read and give some commentaries from our perspective and let people encourage more. Oh my gosh, it worked a lot. It really attracted a lot of, especially young guides and tour guide students about this enthusiasm and everything. And I learned a lot and motivated to read a couple of books and. To be honest with you, I spent a lot of money for the Amazon for that as well. And of course, we hosted some international guests, international colleagues, Michael Dillinger, Alusha, and Marika. They joined our Instagram chats. They really put a lot of value. And our tour members and our guide friends, colleagues, they just realized that we're not the only ones suffering in here, in Turkey, Istanbul, or different part of country. In a worldwide, we are having same problems. That was important for that. And interesting thing, from those live broadcastings, we roughly reached 5,000 people in all around the country. And in Instagram, our followers increased from 300 to 3,500, which is a quite big success. 
and our YouTube channel is growing. And the most important thing, today in all around the Turkey, we have over 60 schools, colleges and universities giving four years tour guiding education. And our YouTube channel is an official uh, reference for many of the, those young guide students, candidates, so they can learn a lot from our knowledge because as you know, knowledge becomes wider when we share together. And of course, different NGOs and some corporates now are knocking our doors about online lectures and virtual tours, which is our new focus, especially for COVID second wave periods. So we are gonna more focus on the subjects as well. And in Turkey, tour guiding students from different colleges established a quite interesting unofficial institution called Guides of Future. So what happened basically, we members of the Take ETC, we took a volunteer approach and we started to give those young guide candidates a field trips. They really learn what's going on in the field. This is something that they could not learn in schools, not in a classroom or an amphi, but on the fields from an expert guys and it really worked well. And many of them actually become more motivated about this job as well. So these are the basic things we did as a small but very influential association from Istanbul, Turkey. And I got my final words to you. I don't wanna take your too much time because we're not official Chamber of Commerce. Tomorrow and Wednesday, our Chamber of Commerce uh, president, presidents will give you the speech about some realistic numbers, how people get affected. But we're basically, I always believe that we tour guides are avid readers, learners, and teachers, and great travelers. And remember what, which, what Mark Twain said, travel is a fatal prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness and uh, prejudices. And I strongly believe that we are the right people who can easily fix many problems. So that's why I'm so proud to be a member of the tour guide world and sharing all these feelings with you guys. By the way, for my all my Jewish friends, Gemar Khatima Tova. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's pause right now because we heard our first four speakers. I have to say, I think things are going better than what we expected. This is fantastic. I think now you can understand better the true power of we communicating with ourselves as members of WFTGA. Just tremendous, tremendous amounts of good ideas and knowledge coming through these sessions. I can't wait for the next session, but let's allow a few minutes now to see if any of our presenters would like to ask questions between themselves. So if you would, any presenters would like to ask questions to another presenter. We're shy, no questions. I think we have Linda and Emma, Jean. No, I'm not seeing yeah. I'm sorry, Emma, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted not so much a question as a comment to say that thank you, um, Helga and Yanni and Mark too, um, for your wonderful presentations. And it's really inspiring. And I know my board, um, our uh, other members and our board is watching too. And the idea of working outside um, in, in, on other areas with the classrooms, would be, um, getting interested in helping students. Um, I think that's a fantastic, fantastic idea. And Mert, I love what you're doing with the Instagram and with the YouTube and having this sort of book chat. That's really, really great. And Helga, I, just, I think all of us are so jealous you got money. You actually got money from the government. So more than questions, it was just sort of comments and saying, you know, it's, um, you know, this is wonderful. There's going to have everyone together and to have a way to exchange these ideas. And um, I can tell you the board, the Gannett board is going nuts right now. We're writing stuff down and getting ready to go. So this is really, really wonderful. So not so much a question as a comment and uh, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Great. How about anyone else? Linda? Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a, a question that I'd just like to echo everything Emma's just said there. There's been some really interesting kind of ideas. Um, but um, Mert, if I could just ask you, 
on the photographs, I could see that you've got large groups of people together. The one thing you didn't mention was any social distancing. This has really hampered us here in Scotland and the UK um, to be able to do any guiding of any significance. Um, did you have social distancing as part of the COVID regulations? Yes, Linda. Actually, we were just getting so close together for a couple of pictures, but generally the rule in Turkey is keeping like a three feet or three and a half, even like a four feet distance mm -hmm. and like a one and a half meter. Especially if you ever get the chance to come to Turkey, guys, in public transportations, in the entrance, the queues for the museums, or even in the entering in the supermarkets, you can see the signs or you can see the marks on the floor and it indicates you, you shouldn't get closer than that. But just for taking a couple of pictures for that presentation, we get to go closer, even took the mask off. And one of the pictures when we were all posing, actually cops came and said, hey guys, put your mask, otherwise we have to pay approximately 150 US dollars fine. It is a lot, especially for Turkish standards. You're right, you have social distancing. Yes, we've, we've had been hampered by not only social distancing, but no groups, no bigger than two households and six people in total. And the guide would count as one household and one of the six. So that has really hampered, anyway, we can talk about it later, but I would just observe that on the, the picture. So thank you very much. But yes, um, I, I do like the ideas that all of the presentations have given us actually. It's been, it's really quite exhilarating to listen to it all. Um, uh, I, I do have a slight caution about guides being teachers. I don't know that sits right with me at all. Um, uh, I, we, we certainly inform um, and we are certainly there to inspire people, absolutely. But teaching, hmm, not, not too sure. Um, however, governments are reacting in very different ways, aren't they not? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting listening to all, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Great. Anybody else? Um, if I can come in here, Jean, I think we, was, we were discussing that there was so much interest for these three days, um, for these sessions and limited time. So we will rerun these for other associations in November. But I suspect we're going to have to do a recap of all our presenters um, today, tomorrow and Wednesday with all of you going with these ideas. In the next two months, I, I have a feeling that many of you will implement some of these ideas and it will be great to hear about that as well. So um, let's watch that space and thank you for, for giving us some ideas. So Jean, I think we can move on with the program. Um, I know that we have Philippines next. Um, I just had a message that they are, unfortunately, the presenter is stuck at a COVID checkpoint in the Philippines um, at the moment. So he was unable to, to get to his computer in time. So if we can then move on to the next presenter from Italy, if you don't mind, Jean. Sure, thank you, Alushka. Just a quick reminder though for everyone, if you enjoy this session, don't forget we have two more. Two more, Tuesday and Wednesday. So please check and register for two more outstanding sessions just like this. All right, our next presenter will be from Italy. If you would please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon or good morning, depending from the part of the world you are connected from. My name is Michela and I am from Italy. Actually, I am a guide of uh, the city of Genoa. And can you see my screen? I suppose, yes. And I am the secretary of uh, NAGT, the uh, National Association of Tourist Guides in, uh, in Italy, which exists since 1985. It was one of the first members of uh, uh, the World Federation of Tourist Guide Associations, and it has about uh, over 3,000 um, associates at the moment. Uh, well, uh, Italy, uh, Italian guides are uh, in a, having a very bad moment, as I have heard, 
all over uh, the world, uh, Italy especially was the first European country to experience the pandemic. So uh, here the picture I took for this first slide is actually a screenshot from our website for the International Tourist Guide Day. Um, well, I'm very proud to say <laughs> that um, since uh, 13, since 2014, we have decided to give a sort of a general national um, organization to the International Tour Guide Day so that we have made a, a proper um, website where we put on schedule everything which happens in the country, a, a Facebook page, and also a Twitter account dedicated just to uh, the Tourist Guide Day. This year, uh, actually everything was interrupted by the pandemic uh, because we had planned many of our events on the 29th of February so that we could uh, possibly skip the, uh, all the festivals for carnival and already on the 24th of February, uh, many regions closed the schools and actually schools reopened only this month in September from March or February in some regions. And already in some regions, there was a sort of uh, prohibition to make any kind of event. So in the north of Italy, for instance, I live in the north of Italy and in Sicily, it was impossible for us to carry on the International Day, uh, the International Guy Day. And we had planned to do some kind of rehearsal, but uh, most of us are still waiting actually to, uh, to give the opportunity to everybody to follow the Tourist Guy Day. Um, Italy had uh, a very long lockdown time, which was from March 9th to May 3rd. And I guess, again, it was the first lockdown in Europe. Uh, here, it's a picture of Milan during lockdown, uh, the beautiful plaza in front of the cathedral, Piazza del Duomo, completely empty and with uh, a close, uh, the, the doors are shut, the doors of the cathedral are shut. During that time, all activities, except the really very important one for the survival of population were freeze, were frozen. And also our activity was frozen. Every activity or profession in Italy has a special code and our, uh, our code was blocked. Uh, it was of course time for studying, time for meeting uh, among us um, colleagues, time for studying, uh, a long time also to try to think about what was going next, but for sure for us it was the high season. Uh, the high season in most of the Italian cities is from April to June when the climate is not too hot and then again September, October. So many of us, many Italian guides really lost their high season completely. Then uh, at mid-May, um, our code, our activity was unblocked. Anyway, it was a slow and difficult restart. Uh, very difficult in the beginning in particular because there were really no tourists at all coming to our cities. Uh, very difficult also with the locals because the people were scared and were worried and they did not like gathering and being together. Um, many regions gave specific rules, but in general, the uh, assembly of uh, regions gave a sort of uh, um, guidelines book, 
where we had every, every uh, possible um, rule to follow. In particular, this is a very good uh, picture to see that masks for the guides and for the participants, social distancing, small groups, and, disin and we have to disinfect, or better, agencies which uh, rent the uh, headsets and the hearing devices have to disinfect them every time. This is a picture taken in July in my city, in Genoa. I think it was the first day the um, office, the information office, uh, organized some tour for tourists and for locals. For sure, locals began to follow uh, tour, uh, tour guides and say um, itineraries more and more. Uh, the lock time town time and uh, the first months after lockdown were times when we really had a hard job in meetings and well, I wonder this morning, how many meetings did we have with government or with local administrations? I spoke with my president, Adina Persano, and we decided to say over 50, but it's for sure an understatement because uh, all the local organizations, local uh, associations had meetings with their administrations trying to uh, ask for some help, for some uh, possibly uh, occasions to work and for some financial help as well. And government uh, took some interventions Actually, the Prime Minister uh, made at least four decrees with uh, uh, helps, sorts of helps and interventions for different categories. And freelance professions uh, were given twice 600 euro and many could have another 1,000 euro uh, as a bonus to say keep on, keep on living and organizing themselves during the time when it was really impossible to work. Um, in Italy we have a, uh, we say better than nothing. I mean it was a, of course some help, not enough really to face uh, a year when we are really working very, very little. If you think that, for instance, I have to pay 4,000 euro in every year for my pension, plus something more than that for my uh, taxes. So it did not even cover a little part of what I have to pay just for, say, the state and for my pension. But it was anyway a help. And we are expecting some more help. Uh, there was uh, the intention to uh, help us uh, a little bit more was inserted at the last moment in the last decree by the prime minister but we are waiting from some implementing decree to see actually how it's going to be. Uh, Italy is divided into regions, 20 regions, and nine out of the 20 regions also took some measures in favor of the guides. Uh, some gave some bonus again, so some financial help, and uh, only one, uh, Sicily, on the contrary, gave help to the tourists. And I found that a very good idea. Uh, the tourists who go to Sicily and stay more than a number of nights, they receive something for free. It can be uh, an extra night in the hotel. It can be 
an excursion, it can be a guided visit. And um, we thought it was a very good idea to really help uh, tourists uh, decide to go to a specific destination and at the same time, a very good idea to help the workers work, not be a, a simply, uh, how could I say, financially helped. Paradoxically, those cities which are more attractive to the tourist, the art cities like Rome or Venice or Florence, are those which are suffering more because they are those which are more attractive to the international tourism. As you know, uh, Italy is a uh, prime rate uh, tourist uh, destination and uh, not only the guides but also all the uh, say professions who work with tourism live on the uh, international arrivals from America, from US, from Brazil, from Russia, from uh, also Latin America and those tourists are completely missing. So we, we haven't seen them since February practically. Also we are missing group tourism. So paradoxically those destinations which were more um, chosen by the locals, more chosen by the domestic tourists, are those which in a way did better or they balanced better. I have spoken about uh, something, all the difficulties we had up to now, but of course there were also some good achievements. Uh, when I began, I, I was saying we had time to study and we had for sure time to, uh, for instance, use technologies. I come from the region Liguria. Genoa is in Liguria, the region where the Cinque Terre are as well. And during the lockdown time, we uh, tried to do visits with Zoom, exactly as we are speaking in this moment. We did them for free at the beginning to students who were having all their lessons uh, from their homes and they were really bored and sad and psychologically it was not a very good time for them, but also to all the people who uh, had some uh, difficulties like uh, young people uh, who uh, live in uh, communities. It was an extraordinary uh, experience, very nice, very motivating, and we learned know-how, which I hope we will use in future, maybe to reach those tourists who uh, cannot travel for some reason those who would like to be tourists but cannot move, have health problems or whatever. And also, very Please good... I, sorry? Please wrap up your session. Yes. And then another very good achievement was those of uh, many guides in the different regions who organized uh, tours for locals or anyway open tours. These are pictures from Marche, the first one, and the second one is Siracusa in Sicily, where the guides made an agreement with the enterprise running the archaeological park, and they had over 6,000 visitors. So also a very good achievement in uh, economical, under an economical point of view. Thank you very much. And your attention and I'm ready to answer to questions when there is the question session. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Appreciate it. Now please Thank be aware you. I have to remind everybody that we have a 12 minute limitation to be fair to everyone. So please try to 
stay within those boundaries. Like I said, I'll let you know at one minute, then you need to wrap it up. All right, let's continue on to our next presenter from Serbia, young lady I have the pleasure of meeting and working with because she and her, her husband are the host committee for our convention come up in 2022 in Novi Sad, Serbia. So let's hear from our next presenter. Hello, thank you, Jean. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, I hope you do. Um, I have some tr trouble with the internet connection today. Uh, it's a, a kind of bad weather here. So I hope uh, this um, this will be a successful presentation of um, our association journey. Um, I have prepared a very short presentation, mostly uh, a couple of photos. Uh, so before, uh, before I uh, share the screen, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, as Jean said, uh, my name is Ivana uh, Churuvia. I come from uh, Serbia, Novi Sad. I'm a president of uh, Serbian National Tourist Guide Association. Uh, and uh, we are, as uh, most of you probably know, the hosts of the next World Federation Convention. Um, and um, the presentation of uh, our activities, uh, you will see are um, somehow different from uh, most of the others, uh, the other speakers that were uh, saying, um, till, that were presenting till now, because uh, most of our activities this year were connected with, uh, with the World Federation Convention that we were supposed to have uh, in February, 2021. Um, so uh, before, uh, before I start speaking about um, our association and our uh, activities, our association exists for 10 years and uh, we have uh, over 80 guides. We are not a very big association. In Serbia, we have a couple uh, of other association, locals and uh, national as well. So um, uh, also this year, uh, we were renewing our licenses, which is something that uh, is completely new in, in Serbia. So I hope we will have number of how many guides we have uh, until uh, the end of this year. Uh, so our association is not big, but we are, we are very active in World Federation uh, since we were founded uh, 10 years ago. Uh, our goal uh, of our association is um, actually to, to gather uh, guides. We are non-profit, uh, non-governmental association as uh, uh, all the other associations are. Uh, but uh, our goal is actually to help our colleagues improve, uh, um, improve their job and to, uh, to get to learn more, to, to um, co uh, communicate with, uh, with guides from uh, the other parts of the world. So what we were doing, what, what was uh, our main activity in previous years uh, was uh, connecting uh, with, uh, through World Federation with uh, other associations uh, and uh, also to deliver training uh, to our uh, members, but also to, to guides from Serbia who are not members uh, of uh, our association. It doesn't matter whoever was interested to participate in the training they were more than welcome to, uh, to join us. So um, this year uh, is um, very tough for, for everyone, as we already heard, uh, also for us, for our association. Uh, in Serbia, we had um, uh, first cases of, uh, of COVID in March, uh, but our activities were um, also, um, we, we had activities even before uh, before this um, uh, case of, of COVID. So our activities, as I said, were, were related with, uh, with convention. Now, as, um, um, as a status of, uh, of COVID, the um, uh, uh, situation of uh, this year is that uh, since March, since beginning of March, we actually, um, our country was uh, closed. We were shut down like uh, most of you were. Uh, we could not uh, get out of our uh, homes. We even had police hour. Um, 
so uh, we could not, uh, uh, it was uh, forbidden by, by law at that time to get out uh, of our homes. Uh, and uh, that state was from, uh, let's say, middle March until uh, beginning of May. Um, and um, we, we had very limited um, um, uh, possibility to, to walk and get out of our, uh, of our apartments. Now, uh, that also affected tourism. Our borders were closed, uh, airports uh, stopped working, so everything that was related to tourism uh, stopped. And uh, our job as guides uh, was affected by, by that, as uh, uh, all previous colleagues uh, said. So the situation till now, um, I'm happy to say that at the moment, we, we are really uh, having very low number of new cases in Serbia. Uh, the schools are reopened since uh, 1st September, even though some specific measures are uh, uh, taken place. So our kids are going to school with, uh, with masks and they are going in different uh, groups uh, to, to limit the number of, uh, of kids in the classroom. So uh, these, uh, these are actually the measures that uh, affect everyone. So when we are going to public places, we need to wear masks and the number of uh, people who can uh, gather uh, together uh, is uh, limited. Uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, these numbers are changing all the time, but I think at the moment it's uh, not more than 30 people in the closed space. So when we are working, we can work now as guides, but uh, the, the number of people we can guide is actually limited to, to 30 people. It's also uh, the distance, um, let's call it physical distancing, not social distancing uh, should be uh, one meter, one meter and a half between um, ourselves. So when we are even outside, uh, we have to uh, keep the distance. So what, uh, what happened with us as, um, as guides is that uh, most of our co colleagues who are working with uh, um, uh, foreign visitors, they uh, lost uh, their tours uh, till the end of the year and there are no announcements uh, uh, for, not even for the next year at the moment. We are all still waiting to see what is going to happen with the second wave and how, how it's going to react. Um, and that affected um, us uh, very much. Um, and uh, our colleagues are, are struggling like uh, colleagues uh, around the world. So uh, our government actually um, um, in, um, proposed uh, or delivered some, uh, some measures, uh, not only for tourism, these measures were for, uh, for all the industries. And uh, the measures, first of all, uh, each uh, adult citizen uh, got uh, help, I think, of 100 euros. That was in, in June. But uh, after that, um, um, employers were, were getting um, uh, salaries for um, whoever is employed, um, uh, not the full salary, but the minimal, uh, minimal wage, actually. Um, in, uh, in Serbia, so uh, all the employers, all the companies were getting this kind of uh, help from the government. Uh, first it was for three months and then um, uh, they renew it, I think, for another three months. However, uh, that uh, did not affect tourist guides that much because uh, the same situation as uh, Helga mentioned in, in France, they have uh, we are, uh, uh, tourist guides have different status. So those who were fully employed by a travel agent or, um, or any other company, they were receiving this kind of help. But those who were freelance, who don't have their companies, they didn't get this kind of uh, help from the government. So there was, um, an there was um, a movement of, uh, of our colleagues uh, 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 trying to get uh, some additional help from for tourism industry, uh, but uh, till now we didn't have um, any reply from uh, from the government. We will see how how this will uh, be solved uh, in the future. Now I will share the screen so you can see some photos um, and uh, see some of uh, the activities that uh, that we were uh, doing um, and. Um, 
Uh, let's see if, um, if you can see that. So um, what, uh, what you can see now on the screen are actually photos from our meetings from um, World Federation Convention preparation. And as I told you, as hosts, our journey this year was a little bit different and our activities were a little bit different than uh, many of the other associations. So we were, we were very much um, uh, focus on uh, preparing everything for the convention that was supposed to be in February 2021. Um, and uh, our, uh, our activities were also very much affected by this uh, COVID situation because we were working on registration and website and uh, all of these were, were prepared and, and ready to, to go alive uh, at the end of March. Uh, however, uh, because of the situation in the world, um, together with the World Federation of Tourist Guides Association Expo, uh, we decided uh, not to open the registration until we see what is going to happen. Uh, so we actually stopped with the registration and uh, with launching of the website, even though these, uh, these two are, are ready to go. Uh, we were doing. We we continued working on the promotion of the World Federation, and uh, I will encourage you here to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram, um, because um, uh, we have um, we are posting uh, every week uh, something about Serbia, about our tradition, about our culture, in order to encourage you to uh, to come to Serbia for the next World Federation convention. Uh, then also we have we were working on communication with our partners for the convention and as most of you probably know for the convention we we have a very um, big organization behind so we were communicating with hotels with convention center we were uh, communicating with the tourism organization with the uh, regional and local and um, many other people who are involved in these um, in in the preparation of the convention uh, what uh, what we did this year is actually trying to write projects even though uh, we are all by covid the the country uh, still was um, i mean our ministry of tourism was um, giving grants for projects and i'm happy to say that our uh, association got uh, a grant for a project uh, which uh, um, was uh, planned to, to include promotion of the convention, but also training uh, of the guides who were supposed to be uh, included in the convention. So at the moment, we are, we are working on, on, this, uh, on the project. Now, after uh, cooperating with Expo, after uh, doing some surveys of, uh, from you, our colleagues from all around the world, we actually decided to postpone, uh, not to cancel, but to postpone the convention and to move it for uh, February 2022, uh, because this situation affected um, all the colleagues around the world uh, financially, and we still don't know if we will be able to travel or not. So um, this was our uh, mutual decision to uh, move the convention for 2022. So we are now continuing our activities on organizing the convention, but now for 2022, and we are we are working on uh, on that uh, uh, at the moment, and we will continue doing it till the end of this year. So um, I hope that uh, you will have a chance to come to to Novi Sad to Serbia in 2022 and to enjoy uh, the town of Novi Sad that you can see now on the photo. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and uh, hope to see you live somewhere soon. Great, thank you very much. Very good. All right, now for our final presenter, which I'm looking forward to. Let's hear from the Scottish tour guide. Would you please? Thank you. just to get it to the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, it's Linda Arthur here um, and I'm the chairperson of 
the STGS, Scottish Tourist Guides Association. I couldn't think of a title to give this, so I just called it Action Stations, because that's certainly what it feels like we've all been at um, for the last um, few months. Um, who knew it would continue for this long? Anyway, I'm, uh, I represent uh, all of the branches of the Scottish Tourist Guides Association. We have 500 members in total. Um, Blue Badge Guides, so who can guide anywhere in Scotland, and Green Badge Guides, who are regional guides, and then some Yellow Badge Guides, who are employer or site-specific um, guides. Um, the uh, training follows uh, EN 15565 regulations and the Blue Badge course is also accredited by World Federation. Um, the STJ has a board of directors who are all nominated or elected by each region and has a member on the board. So there are about um, uh, five different regions um, and then there's the island groups as well. Most of Scotland, if you've been um, to it, um, you'll know it's incredibly rural. And we talk about the central belt of Scotland, and that's the area near the border with England that is covered by both Glasgow and Edinburgh, the two major cities. And that's where most of the kind of guiding activity that, that you guys have been talking about will probably happen. We do a lot more extended tours um, in the country. So this just gives you a diagram of the board of directors. We have different uh, groups here. Um, a CPD committee, continuous professional development. So all of the um, courses you've all been talking about online, this is the sort of committee that handles all of that. The Blue Badge Committee is about delivering only the Blue Badge course. Um, it's a 18-month course. We have a training committee, which is about keeping the integrity of the exams and integrity of the um, standards of performance that we all guide to. Uh, and the training manager reports to that. And she kind of oversees that the courses are all to standard. Um, an administration committee for our staff. We've, well, when I wrote this a few weeks ago, we had five staff. We will be going to go down to three because of the financial hit that everybody's talking about. We've had to redesign what we're doing. We've got a marketing group who look at much of the social media, any kind of media that we can use to promote STGA. Finance committee, important in every group. And we had a cruise ship committee, which has been kind of temporarily suspended, but it will come back um, into action. So um, I'll, this is what where we were at here, just giving you a bit of background there, but this is where we were at when COVID had hit us in, in March. We had Blue Badge exams were halfway to completion. There were 36 students who'd spent 18 months learning and were desperate to get qualified and get that badge and get working. Um, we had a marked tour plan. Um, that's kind of like um, tour management details and that kind of element of our training. And they have um, Viva's discussions with principal examiners about professional skills and so on. All that had been done. But the two big parts of the exam were on a coach. Two days on a coach, 36 people plus the examiners, um, and they were to do a full day's coach tour, walking tour and a site visit as part of their exams. And that's what we got stuck at. You can imagine the frustration of the guides. Um, we also had some written exams, short and long answers that had to be done too. So we started, like many of you, um, trying to explore. We, ha we had some green badge exams in Shetland and the Northern Highlands that were just halfway through the training. And because they were so uh, such early stages, I'm afraid they have kind of got a little bit stuck, um, but they're left with the coach to us to do as well. And the new season, um, uh, we had diaries full of work, all of us. Um, we had uh, a booking system filling up with work, just as we would have expected it. 
and lots of more work for guides to be confirmed. So like the starting point of our season is March and, uh, and it all started at that point, just as it is for you guys. Um, immediate solutions. Well, we tried every way to get that coach tour booked and get it sorted. But um, as COVID hit, we had regulations fast and furious coming at us about the numbers. I'm, I'm astounded one or two of you have talked about 30 people. We've not been able to have more than uh, about, um, I think at the most it was 12, but it soon got down to six or eight people was the maximum number. And with a group of 36 students, that meant several coaches had to be organised. But to start with, we just had absolute lockdown, so we couldn't uh, get anywhere. Um, what I'm saying here is that during our course, we have four regional um, exams, and that's because of the, the, the dynamics of Scotland, really. Um, we could revert back to those exams um, because it gave us a kind of continual assessment for the marks at a lower rate slightly, but we managed to award uh, on that basis so that the students were not left hanging for months and months on end. Um, we did manage to uh, agree to get um, a way of passing them at least to their great relief. Um, sadly, however, none of them have got experience by now. They should have had a whole season under their belts and be very experienced guides, but none of them have been able to work at all. Um, the Green Badge uh, in Shetland and the Highlands are still on hold until it's safe to continue. But the worst thing was that the booking system just plummeted instantly. And I know lots of you will understand that. We had a system whereby um, tour operators could contact us. We would, for a commission, uh, arrange guides to do their work for them. Um, and um, the guides paid us a little bit, but we managed the finances of that for them as well. So we got the money in and we paid them out to the guides. And all of that, well, it's completely collapsed. Um, and it was a major source of income for the organisation. So that has given us, you know, really a, a worker with no work to do. Um, so in that sense, it's been a little bit disastrous. Um, we've had to completely rethink what we do there. Um, my next slide there it is. So apart from all of those kind of practical things, as a board, we started to think about strategic positioning, which obviously some of you guys have done as well. Um, first of all, we took advantage um, of a group that was um, set up by the government and the tourism industry. It was called STURG, the Strategic Emergency Action Response Group. Um, and a member of our board had worked inside the Scottish office, the Scottish government, um, prior to being a guide. So he kind of knew how things worked and that you don't talk to ministers, you talk to the people who work for the ministers because they are the people who can get at the right information. Um, and so we got ourselves on here and since it was a brand new group, um, we managed to take advantage of that. Um, the STAR group is made up of industry sectors, not only government bodies who are, advise the ministers uh, and the Prime Minister of Scotland, we call it the fir her, her the First Minister, um, but the remit of the group was actually to gather facts about which parts of the tourism industry were suffering the most. Um, well, it all was, but it meant that we got a voice in there and we could actually start saying, we've got self-employed guides. All of our guides are self-employed. And um, then some of them are not getting covered by the initiatives that you're setting up. For example, we have a furlough scheme where the government would pay 80% of the wages of your employees um, and you paid the other 20%. That helped the staff in the office, but it didn't help guides one iota. Um, so we were able to make a new case for them about trying to get more help 
to self-employed people in general, of which our guides were uh, a big number. And some of them did manage um, to get, um, I think it was the lid from Italy, um, was saying, I think it was about two and a half thousand pounds each guide could get, but that was tiny compared to what we would normally earn in a season, but at least it kept the wolf from the door, so to speak. Um, we also made sure that we were very helpful to that STURG group and its member organisations. We responded quickly to any information that they wanted, um, often on the same day, and by making ourselves a very useful part of that organisation, we got heard more and are now embedded well into the group. So much so that we wrote um, a protocol for um, COVID guiding and one particularly for walking tours. Um, we, it was initiated by the London Guild and they allowed us to take that and adapt it. So small country, the UK, made up of four countries and each one of them have got different COVID regulations that we're working to, which one is minute. not helping. Thank you. Um, so now we have, we are now the industry sector guidance as far as the, the um, uh, government are concerned um, in uh, COVID. Like all of you, we've been doing lots of informing of members. I've sent out newsletters that had mu multiple subjects, um, including mental health support. Um, and uh, we circulated monthly reports from STURG and STA is the Scottish Tourism Alliance and Visit Scotland is um, the outward facing part of the government that uh, attracts visitors into Scotland. So we're circulating what all of those people are saying. We've had online meetings, an online AGM, a special general meeting um, and a third that I just had last week. Um, and as well as replying to lots of uh, emails. Our branches all made uh, membership calls to individuals to make sure everybody was well supported um, and uh, uh, getting the right help that they needed. Um, and the, the branches helped us when the staff were on furlough to be able to get uh, information out to guides. Um, I would say that um, we are taking advantage of Zoom uh, as all our board meetings will be Zoom now. It's going to save us a fortune in traveling expenses at least. Um, we are using Zoom for parts of the exam now. We're going to be using Zoom um, as part of our teaching protocols as well. Um, and we've had guides who've uh, certainly used um, the virtual guiding and so on that many of you have been talking about as well. This allows us to save money, but also it keeps our training going uh, as well. Um, the strategic working groups have been strengthened very much. And so now we're going to start and make, you know, kind of build on that um, and keep that as part of our board makeup. Um, the staff roles and positions have had to be reviewed um, and we have taken this time to take stock on what ST are do doing in Scotland and what efficiencies and oh, better ways of working um, can be um, so that um, used our time wisely as much as we possibly could. We need to um, start that's it. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So there you have it. Some outstanding. What, let, me, let, me, let me ask Anushka a quick question. I did not hear what you said concerning the Philippines. What did you say? So unfortunately, our presenter from Philippines got stuck in a bit of traffic on his way to the office um, due to their COVID checkpoints. They have many checkpoints in play. So he will not be able to join us today. So I think we can move on to any questions that um, have come through. And I've got a couple for you, Jean. And then we can wrap up today's uh, session. Sounds good. Go ahead. 
Great. I think, um, Michaela, um, you had a couple of questions on the chat box regarding um, that were directed to you. Um, you presented on the safety protocols um, that were in place, but we had a, a questions just um, if you could elaborate on um, exactly a wearing of the mask and how you did that in the museums and in vehicles. You touched on it in your presentation, but one of our viewers are more interested in a little bit more detail. Um, could you uh, handle that? Yes. Uh, so uh, at the moment, the masks are compulsory in uh, every, every play, public place, which is inside. Uh, outside, um, it's not compulsory if you have enough distance from one person to the other. But uh, during guided tours, the guides have to wear the mask all the time because we still have very old guidelines and so it's, uh, it's compulsory. And it should be compulsory for participants. So generally speaking, I tend to ask my clients, the very few I have seen <laughs> this season, to keep to have the mask on all the time. Um, then, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, the guidelines only speak about small groups and they do not say exactly how many. But in some re regions, uh, there were some extra guidelines uh, talking about 12 or 15 people. When, uh, but when we have to go into museums, it's different because every museum has a different rule and that's a big problem. It can be that you have two museums really near each other next door and in one you can take five people, in the other one you can take 10, in the other one you can take 12. And so it's almost impossible to organize something with a group of a certain number of people, no, no matter how many, you cannot do the, a, an itinerary through uh, museums or art places. Uh, if I can add one thing, the only ones who, who really could do a little bit whatever they wanted were often non-qualified guides. Even during the lockdown mode, period if you were not qualified you didn't have to show anything you were offering a free tour and you only had two people you could simply say this is my cousin and you could you were allowed to go around with uh, your family even in uh, the in, in the very beginning so those were the, the people who in a way worked more in the darkest moments. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Next question. Um, not so much a question, but a comment, a couple of comments for Ivana. So, um, Ivana, it seems there are quite a number of people who are very sad at the postponement of the convention. But I think if I can say from our side, we, we are happier with the decision. It had to be made. And um, a lot of work has been put into the convention from our host side, from the World Federation side. And we really look forward to welcoming everyone in person at our next convention in a year's time, <laughs> a year and a bit. Um, so Ivana, that was just a comment. Everybody is feeling it, but there will be in Novi Sad in February, 2022. Yeah, and we are happy to see them all. Good. Um, and then Jean, we had a couple of raised hands and I asked them if they had any questions, but I think it was just little slips of the mouse or slips of the buttons. Um, so nothing has come through on the chat. But if you will allow me a couple of minutes, Jean, um, I would just like a few comments from my side. Anushka, I forgot something, so could you bear with me for sure. a few minutes? Uh, we did sure. not allow we did now allow the last three presenters to ask questions among themselves. So of course. let's give them the opportunity and see if they have any questions. Absolutely. Any questions from the last three presenters? All right, there being none, Alushka, would you please? 
Um, so just to wrap up our session today, a couple of, of things did resonate with me. And, you know, something we all definitely know is that we have gone through the same journey, very similar journeys, but equally so, we've gone through very many different journeys. And, I, and I've noticed that from all the presentations. So thank you to all our association members for taking the time to put these presentations together. Um, but firstly, Emma, your Red Thursday, the 12th of March, um, a fantastic way to just highlight how things changed instantaneously. Um, that, was, that was a really good slide and, and that really resonated. Um, and then also, Linda, you put into words action stations. I think that was such a good term to sort of it's a startling term and sort of tells us exactly what we all kind of went through just in a period of a few days. Um, so that was a really, really good, a good, um, good way to alert us to that. And then what all of you have done in the way of supporting your members, approaching the governments, um, really, really inspirational. So, so from my side personally as a tourist guide and then also from the WFTGA side, um, I just want to thank you for some lovely ideas. Um, some we are unable to implement moving forward, but I think you have given many other associations and viewers some great ideas. Um, so those will be great. And I hope we see you at our next session in November with a follow-up. Um, and I hope we get to, to get to some new stories and where you've moved forward and, and where you're still stuck potentially. Um, so from my side, Jean, just thank you to all the participants. Thank you to the presenters. And um, presenters, if you can remain online um, after Jean has done the closure and, um, and we'll say goodbye to the participants. So Jean, all yours. Thank you, Alushka. Just one quick thing. We had mentioned in the beginning that some of our executive board members might be attending. Some of them are running a little bit late. Have we gotten any more executive board members to attend so we can recognize uh them? I think Viola is watching as a participant. Um, she's snuck in there after her training session, so she's she's with us as a participant. Um, but online for now, it's just the two of us, Jean. Okay, good. Well, uh, Viola just does a tremendous job for us as a, a head of trainer. And just, just to mention the rest of the board members, we got, of course, Aluska is our president. Viola Lewis is the, is the head of training. Uh, we call him Manu, but it's Romano Del Rosario uh, from the Philippines. He's the one that's barely coordinating the coaching cards, which are very important. And then we have Arash from Arash Nawagahi from Iran. And Arash is one of those very talented individuals that we put him to work on, on everything. And then last, uh, I also sit on the board, Gene Reyes. My job is to stay out of the way most of the time. No, I am the I am the liaison uh, between the executive board and the area representatives, the all important area representatives that we have. We have an excellent team, and they can keep busy just like your expo. So, don't forget once again, we're going to have the next two days. We're going to have other sessions, but please be sure to register. Check the times. The times are different, so be sure to check the times on your time zone. And we hope you can join them once again. I think you can see the power of communications, the power that we have when we start talking to each other. All the presentations were excellent. We really appreciate your efforts, the support, and of course, our all important members. We hope you found some value in what we've had today. So with that, I will ask that we can conclude this session Hope you have a nice day and please stay safe. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you.